Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with the one who has the contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths are your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. Please join me in reading the portion of Psalm 95 appointed for today. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. 
In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Reading from Paul's first letter to the Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and for his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then, they will, then also they will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the final semester of my term at seminary, Teresa and I both had the privilege of joining several classmates on a guided pilgrimage through the Holy Land. And over the span of about 10 days or so, we saw some of the most holy sites in the Christian faith. And the thing that we, we quickly found out was that whenever something holy could have happened somewhere, there was only one thing to do, put a church on it, maybe even two churches. During our journey, we, we literally crawled into the low doors of the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem and saw the supposed site of Christ's birth. We ventured into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and, and touched the stone that Christ's body was possibly laid on. And we dipped our feet into the cold and yet murky waters of the Jordan River to the sounds of a mass being celebrated on the banks of the shore. And there's so many symbols and signs and memories that stick with me from this, this trip. But there was one holy sight that struck a very surprising chord with me. About one week into our pilgrimage, we were brought to a church on the outskirts of Jerusalem's old city walls. And the church was called Peter in Gallicantu. It was a church erected by the French Augustinian Catholics and its name was Latin for Peter and the Cock's Crow, a nod to the holy site that this particular church stood upon. Archaeologists have suggested that this is the site of the high priest Caiaphas's palace, and therefore possibly the place where Jesus was put on trial and imprisoned. On the bottom of this three-story building are caves, that appear to be prison cells from the first century AD, giving some weight to these claims. However, what caught my attention that day was found above these holding cells, 
The floor above was an active church still used by the local community. And the sanctuary was very simple, very modestly adorned, except for three life-sized icons on the walls. And each of these icons helped tell part of the same story, part of the church's namesake, Galicantu, the cock's crow. On the left side of the church, the first image depicts Peter and Jesus in the courtyard of the high priest Caiaphas. And high above them on a rooftop is a rooster who crowed, marking Peter's three denials of Jesus. The inscription under the image were the simple words that fell from Peter's mouth. I do not know the man. And there were many facets of this image that captured the tragic dynamism of Peter's denial of his Lord. For instance, in, in the image, Jesus stood in a meek position, bound around the wrists, looking longingly at his friend. And Peter stood in stark contrast, feet wide apart, firmly denying his association with Jesus. And Peter's outstretched hand in denial was, was caught in his robe, almost as if to say how ardently he opposed his association with Christ. And while Christ stood there with his gold leaf halo crowned above his head, noticeably absent from this image was the halo that typically adorned Peter. Odd. On the right-hand side of the church was the opposing image to the story, the completion to the narrative, the rehabilitation of Peter on the shore of Galilee, where three times he affirmed his love for Christ. And they were reconciled. And Peter was made into the metaphoric sheep of the early church. Perhaps even this signing a beautiful reversal of the first scene, something of a happy ending to the story. But the image that really caught my attention was directly behind the altar. The second image in the series. In it sat one despondent figure with the inscription below as follows. And he went out and wept bitterly. In the image, St. Peter sat weeping on a precarious seat, directly above the cleft of a rock, a symbol often associated with the abyss of hell, of total despair and destruction. This was almost as if to remind us that at any moment, Peter could slip into this pit in his stunned sorrow, or maybe even fling himself off into utter destruction. And as Peter sat, one hand on his chin, perhaps contemplating in sorrow, the other hand that had once been used to deny Jesus was now crushed between his knees, as if to say that this hand should never be used again. And most shocking of all, for the first time, the head of this inconsolable man was graced with the crown of the saints of God's kingdom the crown of Jesus Christ the King, the crown of eternal sainthood was placed upon this man who in the great hour of trial failed to acknowledge Christ before him. And this seems to make no sense because the proper response ought to be judgment. Our parable today on Christ the King Sunday is often used as is some sort of imperative for humanitarian efforts, a seemingly noble call. But couched within it is also the language of judgment, almost implying that our failure to see Christ in others will result in some kind of damnation. And this is a troubling suggestion because Christ does not coerce us into this kind of service. He mercifully invites us to seek 
and to serve him in freedom. The images I described seem to imply this same startling reality. Because somehow Peter is deemed righteous, despite his ultimate failure, to see and serve Christ. In today's parable, Christ tells us to recognize the Lord in all the peoples of the earth who need mercy, but Peter could not even recognize Emmanuel, God with us, when he looked him in the eyes. Forget visiting those in prison. Peter wouldn't even accompany his Lord and King to prison. But unlike earthly kings and rulers, Christ is not crowned God and King of all by force. Rather, we affirm that Christ is King through our insecurity and our failures and our weakness. Jesus is known as king when we recognize our complete dependence upon him and his merciful rule. And when he is crowned through our weakness, to our surprise, he too crowns us as heirs worthy of his kingdom. In our utter failure to see Christ in others, and in Peter's, in Peter's case, to see Christ before him, even then we are not punished but shown mercy. And this mercy is that which, when Peter wept bitterly, held him securely suspended over the abyss. This is the mercy that consoled him in the dark night of his soul and raised him back up to share in God's kingdom. This mercy put a crown above his head that which for the rest of his life he would keep trying to grow tall enough to wear. It is mercy, not fear, which stirs us into activity. I believe the punishment described in today's parable is not God's wrath, but our self-condemnation. It is more like the dark night of mourning, the bitter weeping we are drawn to in our failures, the sorrow we reap in the world which we have caused destruction upon, the hand we raise in denial of others' needs, and ultimately, it is most like the utter shipwrecking mercy of the Lord who crowns us with his very own crown. Through our weakness, Christ is recognized as king of all. And by our king, and by his great mercy, we are invited into his eternal kingdom. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them. Now and day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O oh God, our King, by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, you conquered sin, put death to flight, and gave us the hope of everlasting life. Redeem all our days by this victory. Forgive our sins. Banish our fears. Make us bold to praise you and to do your will and steal us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom on the last great day. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We remember especially Crystal, Barbara, Connie, Glenn, Sean, George, Beverly, Bob, Pam, Linnea, Joan, John, Yvonne, Peter, Riley, Julie, Taggart, Stephanie, and Rebecca. And we commend to your mercy all who have died, that, they, that your will for them may be fulfilled. We remember especially Mr. and Mrs. D. and S. Lee. Accept, O oh Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts, and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word, and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit, that we may know him and make him known, and through him at all times and in all places may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. I invite you to join in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, 
We, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Good morning. A couple of important announcements as uh, we change up our schedule and our ways because of the uh, surging coronavirus. Uh, this week, we had originally scheduled a, a noon Eucharist on Wednesday, and we are deciding not to hold that uh, in the effort to, um, to keep everyone um, safe and, and away from one another. And, and so we'll look forward to the time when we can begin those again, but for the time being, Beginning this week, we will no longer have a, a new Eucharist. Starting next Sunday, we will have a new schedule um, again uh, for uh, our presentations of worship. Uh, the Zoom service uh, will go back to 8.30 in the morning. Uh, and we will have then a 10 o'clock service that's live stream. So each will have its own uh, benefits. Uh, and we hope that uh, you will be able to be join us for one or the other of those. Also on Sunday morning, uh, next, starting next week, uh, we will have adult forums. We're moving them from Thursday night to Sunday morning, and the adult forum will come at uh, 11 o'clock following the 10 a.m. live stream. And um, we decided to do um, something for Advent, uh, particularly because we cannot gather and we cannot uh, uh, sing the way we are used to in the seasons of Advent and Christmas tide. So the adult forums are going to be a look at what we actually say when we sing some of our most favorite Christmas uh, hymns. So um, it's really a focus on what we mean by the incarnation and how our hymns express that. I hope that uh, you'll be able to join us and, and uh, be able to relish in, in that music, but also uh, learn a little bit more about uh, what is at the heart of our faith, which is the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, also, uh, beginning um, after next Sunday, when we enter into the season of Advent, uh, we will uh, be embedding in you know, each of the daily meditations throughout the week uh, an Advent or a Christmas um, carol, anthem, or hymn. Uh, again, we thought that it would be nice to bring you some more music from this place as uh, our actual gathering is a little bit more restricted. Finally, uh, let me say that uh, obviously it's uh, Thanksgiving, uh, the holiday this week, and uh, uh, much has been said and much has been worried about in terms of that holiday. Uh, may I simply say that uh, for whatever you're doing, we wish you the blessing, the deep blessing of Thanksgiving. There is yet so much for us to celebrate in our lives together, whether we are uh, physically together or apart. If you are traveling, I hope that you have safe travel. If you are gathering with people, I hope that you can do that in the safest way possible. And I hope that all of us can understand the deep and abiding blessing that we think about on that day. So our blessings to all of you this week.